And this is the biggest one. What's irrevocable is God's Word. It kind of ties into calling because we only have one calling and that's to preach and teach the Word of God. Let's look at 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. This is Paul, senior preacher, talking to Timothy. 1 Timothy, young preacher boy. Now, Timothy's a little more mature. He's getting ready to really take over the ministry. He's going to be the lead pastor. And, and Paul's sharing some things with him. And he says, Charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom. If your mentor starts out a conversation with something like calling, naming Jesus Christ as the one that will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in the kingdom, that, that lets you know this is a serious meeting. He's saying, I'm not talking to you for my sake. I'm, I'm talking to you from God the one that will judge the quick and the dead and appear in the kingdom at the end. Now Timothy's paying attention. And he goes on, the very next verse, first three words, preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. I'm going to stop there for a second. In season and out of season. Would you say that we are currently preaching in a season that is receptive of the message of the Bible? Absolutely not. There was a time when you could get, this room would be full of people, and we'd have people backed up in a parking lot to come in and hear God's Word. You could hold a tent meeting for four days, and people would sit on a hay bale to listen to five different preachers preach the gospel for an entire weekend and bring their friends to come. When's the last time you went by an empty field and saw a tent full of people listening to God's Word? We are out of season right now. We are preaching out of season. But we don't stop preaching because we're out of season. We're supposed to be ready to preach in season and out of season. And listen, the next words. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's a two-thirds, one-thirds rule. Reprove, and rebuke are both negatives. Reprove, I'm going to tell you where you're wrong. Tell you what right looks like. Reprove and rebuke. Doing that well, you're doing this wrong. Then the next, exhort, means encourage. Now this is in season and out of season. There's nowhere in here, there's nowhere in this passage where Paul tells Timothy, in season, go ahead and reprove and rebuke. But when you're out of season, when people don't want to hear the word, I want you, you probably need to focus on encouragement and, and exhortation. No one has ever been called to preach to an individual or to preach from the pulpit. They have never been called to be an entertainer, to be a comedian. To be a theatrical expert, if you want drama, we have some nice theaters in town. If you want entertainment, the Crown Coliseum, they're always selling tickets for something. That is not the preacher's job. That is not your job when you're out talking to others. Your job is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Preach the word. Not entertain the masses. There are churches. This is the church model in the world we live in right now. The church model is you bring in marketing experts. They do a survey and ask people, what do you want at your church? And then the church gets feedback from the community and then they shape their church around that. Let me give you an example. Take your child, or in my case, your grandchild, to the grocery store. Give them a buggy. Give them a buggy and say, you get to do the shopping this week. Push the cart up and down the aisles. Put in the buggy what you think we need. Whatever we need, you put it in there. You get all the choices. You get what we need and we'll take it home. Parents, what are you going to have a buggy full of? It's going to look like you went shopping at Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Am I right? Yeah. 
Because a child doesn't know what they need. They're going to ask for what they... They're going to take what they want, thinking that's what they need. I'm going to drop down 2 Timothy 4, but 1 through 5. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine out of season, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Look at verse 4 closely. Active voice, they shall turn away their ears. This is a choice that the people will make. They're going to turn their ears by choice away from sound doctrine. They don't want to hear a message like this. So by choice, they're going to turn away. When we ask the children what they need, instead of giving them what they want, look at the rest of that verse. Shall be turned unto fables. That's passive voice. So the first is saying the people actively turn their ear away from sound doctrine. The second says those people that are teaching are going to turn them to fables. Because when you stop preaching the Word and you start playing with the Bible and you're more concerned with entertainment, you're more concerned with being funny or putting on plays and skits than you are opening up the Bible, reading Scripture, breaking it apart, and handing it to your people, what you're doing is you're opening the door for them to be receptive of fables and fairy tales. Lies that are told to them by others. So part of, we can't just say, well, it's their fault. That's the active voice part, that they're going to turn their ear away. The passive voice part is we're pushing them away from sound doctrine. Because we're not teaching sound doctrine. So what am I going to prefer? The food that I need or the candy that tastes good. When we go out on the missions field, we cannot be afraid to tell people that which they need. Every man has the same need. Recognize sin and repent of it. We need to point out sin and encourage them to repent of it. That's that balance between reprove and encourage. That's sin. Encourage to repent of that sin. Like a parent works with a child. It may take patience. It may take years. It may take many years. But you have to be consistent. If not, you're feeding them something. If I give the kid all that candy they bought, am I not the coolest parent in the world? To them. Until they eat it all and get sick. The teeth fall out. They get the diabetes. And they say, oh, why didn't you tell me? Now, that's, that's kind of the funny part. But let's look at a part that's not quite as funny. It's prom season. I'm a mom and dad that have, you know, I got a mom and dad at home. I'm a dad. I mean, I'm just saying in this story. You got a mom and dad that have never worried about anything of Scripture. They've never listened to sound doctrine. They give the child what the child wants so they get to be the cool parents. Mommy takes the daughter out and she gets herself a dress. It's got a slit up to the thigh and the center line's cut down to her stomach. And this is her big night to go out and do all the things that she's seen her parents doing for years. She gets to be a grown-up. She's going to go out drinking and partying and doing all the things that she's been allowed to do. Now people, when I'm telling you, when we preach the gospel, we're not just preaching candy coating. we got to preach that hell is a real place. You know that hell is defined as an outer darkness. A place with wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now this little, this little girl, she goes out to play adult. Maybe the parents want to be the really cool parents. And they go ahead and buy them a cooler full of beer. Maybe, maybe they send them off with some whiskey or they stole some whiskey from the parents' liquor cabinet. 
Then the EMTs call. And that pretty little dress is laid out with some blood on it. And those bottles are over in the ditch. And somebody loses their daughter. Never told them. Now to get morbid. A little bit. Hell is a place with gnashing of teeth. Anybody, anybody know what gnashing of teeth is? That's kind of an odd phrase, isn't it? What happens when that mom realizes that she had a part in her daughter's death? She doesn't only keep drinking, she turns hard to the bottom. Eventually her liver shuts down and she finds herself dead in that same lake of fire. And this daughter and this mother, they pass each other in the lake of fire. And that little girl reaches over and she snatches up her mom. And she said, why did you never tell me about this place of torment? Why did you never tell me? And the mom says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's a little too late now. And the little girl starts to gnash her teeth on her mother. And the mother starts wailing. There's gnashing of teeth and wailing in hell. That's a somber picture. Why didn't you tell me? Because I wanted to be the cool parent. Hell is not going to be a party place. It's not going to be a place with, with loud motorcycle pipes, smooth whiskey, and hot women. Take that back. There's going to be hot women. Actually, all the men and women will be hot. As I just said, it's a lake of fire. The fire is never quenched. So if you, if you get this horse woman or a man full of vanity and they spend their whole life worrying about their physical self and they never concern themselves with spiritual self, I guarantee you by the Word of God, when they die, they'll have a smoking hot body. That's funny. You laugh. You can't talk about gnashing the teeth and not finish it up with a joke. <laughs> Because God's grace, God's calling, and God's word are irrevocable. Those do not change. The only thing that changes is how we respond to God's word. Are we going to take His grace for granted, consider it an inevitable outcome? I've got heaven waiting on me, so do what I want the rest of my life. You're going to stop and say, by God's grace, I've been saved. I've been called to Him. Aren't you thankful tonight that God called you to Himself? He's been calling man to Himself since the beginning. If He didn't call you, you couldn't have answered. If you're saved tonight, God called you. And He called you because of His unchanging grace. But you don't think... We could, we could take that for granted, assume the blessing's going to remain, and then watch the blessings be pulled away. Notice I didn't say your salvation is pulled away. Everything that's been placed in my hand, nobody can take out. Right? If you're saved by the blood of Christ, your eternity is secure. But that doesn't mean the blessings on your life are secure. That doesn't mean the forefathers weren't able to save the mothers and fathers. You, your life right now, you could be living for Christ, but your life alone cannot save your children. Your eternity can be secure. But that doesn't mean if you don't pass that on to your children because you take advantage of the grace. You, you, don't, you take for granted the importance and significance of that calling and you don't share it with your children and raise them up so that when they're old they won't depart from it. Our nation, our families, and we ourselves will not only experience will only experience God's blessings if we remain in line with God's irrevocable grace calling the word. That's it. It's the only way this nation's going to be healed. It's not going to be the White House. It's not going to be Congress and Senate. It's not going to be the world. The world on its own isn't going to just suddenly turn and stop eating crap. Right? Kids aren't going to stop putting candy in the buggy. At some point, the parent has to say, no, that's a want. This is what you need. Brothers and sisters, we have a calling. And that calling is to take the grace and explain that to others. To answer that call. And to get into God's Word. 
and do as Timothy was told to do, which is preach the Word. Anything else, you're, take, you're taking the other two for granted. One calling, preach the Word. That's my exhortation for you tonight. That's the encouragement. Preach the Word. Can you preach it if you don't know it? That's why last week we talked about you can't be a reader, you have to be a student. Because if you're going to preach and teach, you've got to know your topic. You've got to know who God is. You've got to know why He put you here. You have to believe that He put you here. It's all tied together. It comes down to one truth. Preach the Word. That's your calling. And that's my message for tonight. Brother Carlos, can you pray us out?